Welcome to activity 5.1. Our learning target today is we're going to determine how the pattern of earthquakes and volcanoes on the earth are related to the earth's plates. So far we've taken a look at earthquakes and we've only briefly talked about where they're located and if there's a pattern of where they're located. So we're going to take it to the next step. One of the things I want to make sure that you do as we move through our book so we're going to be on page 37 to start out, and we'll work through page 38 and 39. Now we are going to make some changes. The book wanted us to use some crackers and some gelatin. We tried it. It just did not work. So we've modified a little bit, and you'll get those directions a little bit later on. What I need you to do working through this lab is to be honest. Where I ask you to pause the video so that way you can answer the question, I want you to honestly pause the video and then answer the questions. Then you'll almost immediately after that, you'll see what the answer is or what the answer could be. And it's very tempting just to work through it and copy everything down and not give it any thought. But that is not the right thing to do. And that's not how an individualized unit work, works. You're supposed to be working at your own pace. You're supposed to be learning the material, not bluff your way through the material. So here's the first thing I want you to do. So you can pause the video after these two questions. So you're on page 37, and it says, what do you already know about earthquakes? And what do you already know about volcanoes? So go ahead and pause the video and answer these two questions. All right. So now you've had a chance to answer these. And obviously I can't give you an answer for this because I don't know what you already know about earthquakes. But what do you know about earthquakes? What have you heard about earthquakes? They seem to be in the news quite a bit. And the same thing with volcanoes, especially with the Hawaiian Islands recently, say over the last year and a half. We've heard quite a bit in the news about the volcanoes that are happening there. So let's move on. If you look at the bottom of the page, here's a colored version of that map that you see. So the following map here shows the earthquakes, the yellow dots, and the volcanoes, which are the red dots, plotted on the earth. And you also see these dark lines here. Those are the different plates, or at least the major plates that you see around the earth, and then some of the smaller plates here too. So use this map to answer the questions that follow. So here's the first question I want you to do. And you should be on page 38. So what kind of pattern do you observe on this map? So go ahead, pause the video, and give the question an honest effort. All right, so you've had a chance to answer the question. So what kind of patterns did you observe? Did you notice that on the map that shows the earthquakes and volcanoes that they have a strong alignment with the plate boundaries? So when you backtrack here, you see a lot of the earthquakes, a lot of the volcanoes a lot fall along these lines. Not all of them, but a lot of them do. So there's a really strong tendency wherever you find a plate boundary to find earthquakes, to find volcanoes. So there are some earthquakes and volcanoes that do not fall on the plate boundaries, but the majority of them do fall on that kind of those plate boundaries. So here's the next question. How might geological events and features such as earthquakes and volcanoes be related to plate tectonics? Use any knowledge you have gained. So go ahead, pause the video, and then go ahead and answer the question. And when you're done, let's take a look at what you have. All right, so you've had a chance to go through it. So what you wrote really is going to be depend, because it's how might geological events and features such as earthquakes and volcanoes be related to plate tectonics. What do you think? You were supposed to use your knowledge for this. Is there a connection between them? Well, let's go on and let's explore this a little bit more. So we're going to do a, an experiment here. And what you're going to need to do is you're going to need to get a couple wooden blocks. And you're going to need to get a plastic film 50 milliliter beaker. You're going to put 20 milliliters of water in the plastic beaker. You're going to lay the two wooden blocks flat on the lab table against each other on the table. The wooden blocks should be touching. So you don't want them far apart. They should be touching, rubbing against each other. So you're going to put the beaker on top of one of the wooden blocks. doesn't matter which one. What I want you to do then is slowly and gently slide the blocks past one another while keeping them touching. Record your observations about the wooden blocks. So when you look on page 38, it says record your observations about the graham crackers for A, 
I want you to change that to record your observations about the wooden blocks. And then, once you get done with that, B says record your observations about the gelatin. That's what it says in the book. But I want you to change record your observations about the water in the beaker. So for A, you're recording your observations about the wooden block. And B, you're going to record your observations about the water in the beaker. So go ahead, pause the video, and do this experiment and come back to the video when you're done. All right, so you've had a chance to do that. What did you observe about the wooden blocks? Was it very smooth when you rubbed them against each other and past each other when you slid them past each other? Or was it rough? If you were pushing on it, did it all of a sudden lock up and then slip again? How about the water? Was the water fairly calm? Did the water have ripple marks in it when you were moving back and forth? Those are some of the observations you should have had as you work through that lab. So now let's look at the questions. Again, we're going to have to modify the questions in your book to go move away from the gelatin and the crackers and then use the wooden blocks in the water. So number one says, what event did you just simulate? What do you, why do you think this? So go ahead, pause the video and answer it. All right, so you've had a chance to answer that question. Did you say that you just simulated two plates moving along each other? Did you say that you just simulated an earthquake? Those are both great answers. And why do you think this will depend on why you thought that. Do you have any experience with this? Have you ever been around an earthquake? Or maybe you've seen earthquakes happening in movies and you have a pretty good idea of how they happen. So, yeah, we just simulated an earthquake. We simulated two plates moving past each other. And as the plates are sliding past each other, as they slip, and there's some tendency or it locks up and then it slips again, those are earthquakes. If the plates just naturally moved and glided by each other and never got hung up, we wouldn't have earthquakes at all. So let's look at the next question. Again, you're going to answer it on page 38 in your book, but you're going to change the question to what do the wooden blocks and beaker represent? So go ahead, pause the video and answer this question. All right, so what do the wooden blocks represent? Well, the wooden blocks represent the boundaries between the Earth's plates. And the beaker represents buildings, water on the surface, or other man-made structures. So when you saw the water in the beaker moving back and forth, think about how a building would react. Is the building going to be swaying back and forth? Are other structures going to be swaying back and forth? Or could it be water in a lake or in the ocean? Are we going to get a tsunami as a result of these earthquakes? And, you know, again, speaking of the tsunamis, probably not if they're slipping by horizontally. It's when you have that vertical motion that you tend to get tsunamis. So how are you doing so far? So let's, talk, let's look on page 39. So here's the next question. What are the similarities of this simulation to the real world? What are the differences? So go ahead, pause the video, and answer this question. All right, so you've had a chance to answer this question. Well, this simulation is similar to the real world because plates actually do rub alongside each other. And when this happens, we actually get earthquakes that impact buildings, bodies of water. And the more rubbing that's going on, the more, the, you know, when they slide past each other, when they catch, if you have a lot of that catching and the pressure builds and builds and builds and all of a sudden it snaps, you can get larger earthquakes. And we have a lot of earthquakes on our planets. And many of those earthquakes are really small. Most of them we don't even feel as humans. It's only the larger earthquakes that we feel. So a lot of these earthquakes are happening all the time, and there's not much slippage going on. But when we get to major earthquakes, more than likely the tension was building for many years, if not decades and even centuries. And then all of a sudden, it snaps. The rock snaps. It reaches its elastic limit and you get that earthquake. And that's what's going to happen with the buildings. That's going to cause a lot of damage. So what are the differences? Well, again, we're only moving these blocks a little bit. If the actual earth only slipped a few millimeters, it's not going to be that big of a deal. But sometimes we get slippage of meters, and that's when you're going to get a larger earthquakes and you're going to get a lot more damage. 
So this simulation is different from the real world because the scale is much different. Plates are giant slabs of rocks in comparison to the size of the buildings. So when we looked at our plates compared to the beaker, the plates weren't very large compared to the plastic beaker that we had, where the plates on Earth are really, really large. And they're much, much larger than the man-made structures that are on them. So let's look at the volcano simulations. What I want to do is I'm going to post these videos. I'm going to post these three videos. What I need for you to do is to watch these three videos. Once you get done watching these three videos, you're going to answer the questions of volcano simulations. So go ahead, pause this. And what I want you to do is watch the videos and come back to this video and complete the lab when you're done. So go ahead, pause the video. All right. So now you've had a chance to watch these videos. So what happens when two plates move towards each other? Well, when continental, oh, sorry, go ahead, pause the video and answer this question. What happens when two plates move towards each other? All right, now you've had a chance to answer the question. When continental oceanic plates move towards each other, one plate moves underneath the other one. The thinner plate was the one that moved underneath the thicker plate. The thinner plate then melts as it subducts into the earth. Now I might say the thinner plate, but Mr. Wittoon, you were talking about plates being more dense and less dense. Well, typically your more dense plates tend to be your thinner plates. The crust on the land on continent, which is less dense, is much, much thicker than oceanic crust. So they're right. It is the thinner plate. And the thinner plate typically is the one that's more dense. So the thinner plate then melts as it subducts into the earth. The melted rock moves upward through the neighboring plate because it is less dense than its surrounding. This causes a volcanic eruption on the surface. And this typically happens at convergent plate boundaries where two plates are coming together because you have that subduction zone happening. If two oceanic plates move towards each other, they create trenches and volcanic island arcs, such as the islands of Japan. If two continental plates move towards each other, they both fold up and create folded mountains. Good example of that is the Himalayan mountains. So how did you do on question one? So I'm going to go to the next slide again. We're going to complete the lab. So again, refer back to the video. What happens when two plates move away from each other? So go ahead and pause the video and answer that question. All right, so you've had a chance to answer the question. What happens when two plates move away from each other? When two plates move away from each other, a ridge forms and the melted material that comes through at the surface solidifies forming rock. As more and more material continues to melt and come through at the spreading center, the plates get pushed away from each other. This is called divergent, this is called a divergent plate boundary. So when we talked about seafloor spreading, how you have those convection currents and the material comes to the surface and it pushes the rocks away and new material, new earth is being created. This is what's happening at a divergent plate boundary. As more and more material continues to melt and comes through at the spreading center, the plates get pushed away from each other. Again, this happens at a divergent plate boundary. Think divergent to divide. So the plates separate. They're dividing. So that's why they call it a divergent plate boundary. Question number three. Why do you think this happens? So go ahead, pause the video, and answer this question. Plates move because they are riding on a slowly convecting solid rock of mantle. Remember, this was the asthenosphere, and it acts like a conveyor belt. As the magma pushes up through, it helps move the plates apart. So again, these are those convection currents that we've been talking about in class, and we've done labs with. So let's take a look at question four. Question four is the last question. Once you get done with this question, there is going to be a check for understanding for you. If you do not pass the check for understanding, you're going to have to redo this lab. You're going to have to go through it again. You're going to have to add notes to it. And then you're going to have to retake the quiz. So what happens when two plates move alongside each other? Hint, think about the wooden blocks and the beaker activity. 
So when two plates move alongside each other, they rub against each other and the earthquakes occur. And this is called a transform fault boundary. So we've taken a look at convergent plate boundaries, where plates are coming together, they're converging. We've taken a look at divergent plate boundaries. And now the third type of common, third common type of plate boundary is called a transform plate boundary. And this is where the plates slide past each other. So they're not coming together, they're not moving apart, but they're sliding past each other. So what happens when two plates move alongside each other? Well, this is what we did with the wooden blocks and the beaker. This is what we simulated. And this is where you're going to have earthquakes. This is the San Andreas Fault down in Southern California. All right, so make sure everything's done. What you're going to have to do once you get done with this lab is you're going to have to get it checked off. I'm going to be checking to make sure you have complete sentences, complete thoughts, and you're not rushing through it. Once you get it checked off, then you're going to have to take the check for understanding. Once you get done with the check for understanding, you're going to have to check with me to see what your score is. If you don't score a passing grade, you're going to have to redo this. You're not going to be able to take the check for understanding right away that same day. That's the penalty. So make sure you take your time, make sure you do well, and make sure you use your book to help you with the check for understanding for Activity 5.1.